Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I'm going to be discussing blue-white in Modern Horizons 3. As always, the notes are available to follow along at patreon.com slash draftingarchetypes. Blue-white is an above-average deck in terms of performance. It's appreciably behind red-green and red-white, though red-green has gotten pretty hard to draft in recent weeks. And it's about on par with blue-black, but it's drafted much less often than those, except that red-green is also drafted infrequently in recent weeks, because it's hard to not have to splash, and because so many people are fighting over Chrysalis, basically. I don't know if its win rate is contingent on it continuing to be drafted infrequently. Presumably more drafters would hurt but the, the deck is you know solid performs well and is drafted very little despite that i think the reason is that it's kind of hard to get into because the cards kind of pull in two very different directions and the blue white uncommon emissary of Soulfire, is fine but it's not very impressive it's not a reason to move into the color. It's more like a nice card if you're there. And Riddle Great Gate Gargoyle, the common 2-2 flyer that gives you 3 energy and you can spend 2 energy to give something an attacker lifelink, is quite good, but it's hard to splash, which means that it's like a very heavy commitment early. Which is also true of Conduit Goblin, but Conduit Goblin, I think, is a little bit stronger and safer to move into because a higher portion of the red and white cards agree about what they're trying to do. And so you can end up with a good red and white deck out of a larger pool of cards that you might get past because... It's not hard to just find, you know, 23 aggressive playables to support your Conduit Goblin, whereas it can be harder to get a coherent blue-white deck, especially if there's any competition for it, and so it can feel riskier to take the Gargoyle early. Because in practice we know that blue-white is drafted much less than red-white, it might actually be safe to commit to Riddlegate Gargoyle as you might to Conduit Goblin and just expect that, well, fewer people are taking the Gargoyles, so I'm more likely to get a bunch of them. So this is a good investment or speculative pick, and if it doesn't seem open, you can pivot off of it. But I do think people do that a little bit less. In general, I think the kind of defining characteristic of blue-white is the fact that the cards really support two very different strategies. Also, I suppose the way that energy works in blue-white is pretty different than how it works in either of the red energy decks. For the most part, blue-white is better at making energy than it is at spending energy. A lot of the best ways to spend energy are red. So blue-white sometimes just ends up with like huge amounts of energy, and while you have ways to spend it, they're like pretty low yield. Red is much better at converting energy for damage or for cards, where blue and white is usually using energy for stuff that's more situationally useful, like tapping a creature or gaining life or looting or something. Royal Cartographer is the big exception to that. That's the uncommon 1-3 that you can tap and spend 6 energy to draw 3 cards, and it has landfall make an energy. That is the best performing uncommon in from among blue and white cards, so not necessarily the best performing in a blue-white deck, that being Scurry of Gremlins. But uh, Row of Cartographer is the best blue or white uncommon in blue-white because you make so much energy and it's so hard to spend it. And Royal Cartographer is 
so much better than all the other cards at spending the energy, such that I think Royal Cartographer is really, really good basically no matter what your blue-white deck is doing, unless you somehow just didn't take any energy cards whatsoever. Continuing on this topic, Tune the Narrative is a relatively bad fit for blue-white. That's the blue draw card, make two energy. The problem is, of course, as I said, you have too much energy and not enough ways to spend it, and Tune the Narrative just contributes to that, where you get more energy, and it doesn't let you spend it on anything. So it's good if you have and draw Royal Cartographer. So if you have like two Royal Cartographers in your deck, it's very good. Otherwise, it's basically just blue draw card. You're not getting a lot out of the energy. And because blue-white is often trying to be a not just an aggressive deck, but an evasive aggressive deck, the significance of evasive there is that it means in general you're getting less damage on your cards like smaller stats lower stat lines because some of the what you're paying for is an evasive threat and what that means is that your cards are a little bit lower impact individually like they have less they like give you less damage over time they give it more consistently but in smaller numbers. And so if you have like a cantrip that doesn't give you card advantage or selection, it increases the odds that you flood out and that your low impact cards don't amount to enough to kill your opponent before their higher impact cards kill you. So attune the narrative can exacerbate a problem that the deck can naturally have with the fact that it excels at efficient cheap creatures, but those efficient cheap creatures are relatively low impact in absolute terms. So you want to be careful with playing more low impact cards, and you want your cheap cards to contribute to getting your opponent dead, either efficient removal spells or efficient creatures, because if you're like the sum impact of all the cards in your deck is small going long won't be good for you. And that also means that if you have too much removal and you spend too much time trading cards one for one without establishing a clock first, you'll again get to the late game where your opponent's top decks are just a lot more impactful than yours. So you, if you are drafting an aggressive blue-white deck, want to be really careful to maximize your ability to curve out and establish a clock above other considerations because the risk of like going to a long game where other people start playing reach creatures and you can't get through anymore or just like playing you know card draw and removal that you can't keep up with because you're not prioritizing card draw because you need to be establishing a clock so you get ground out by blue red or blue black those would be concerns with the aggressive build, especially if you don't have like a sufficient density of aggressive threats. When you are the aggressive build, you're looking to prioritize area auxiliary, the four mana three three flyer that puts a plus one plus one counter on each of up to two creatures when it enters. A Riddlegate Gargoyle, the blue white common, two two flyer, mandibular kite, the white living weapon that gives plus one plus one in flying. Those are kind of your premier aggressive flyers. Serum Visionary, the 3-mana 2-2 that casts Serum Visions when it enters, is like a good enough card that you want it. Like You're happy to have a threat that draws a card. You have some efficient removal with Dog Umbra and Thrab and Charm and Demon Farrier. And then the other white creatures that... You know, and any of the other normal aggressive creatures make sense here, and then you can have a top end of some five mana four fives that stun your opponent's creatures and have reach the Eldrazi. Stuff like that. Overall, the aggressive builds of Blue White are the best performing. And I think that that makes sense because they 
use Riddlegate Gargoyle the best, and Riddlegate Gargoyle is a large payoff for being in blue-white, especially given that blue-white is not drafted very often. So blue-white players will often have a lot of Riddlegate Gargoyles or have access to a lot of Riddlegate Gargoyles, and drafting in such a way that you can maximize their impact makes sense. Despite that, I personally am more interested in blue-white control that is drafted around a lot of the cards that are less effective or even least effective in the aggressive builds of blue-white. So basically, I'm looking to draft a whole bunch of cards that have pretty bad win rates and combine them into something that I think makes sense. So, basically, Blue-White has access to a lot of reasonable card draw spells, card advantageous plays, engines, and efficient removal, most of which are not high priorities for other decks. And I like the way that they combine when you're intentional about it. These cards don't perform well in blue-white in general because they don't pair well with the aggressive flyers plan. But I think if you draft as a serious control deck, then I think they make a lot of sense. So you have like Brain Surge, the three mana draw four, put two back instant at Uncommon, and Deep Analysis, the four mana draw two with flashback, two mana and three life draw two. And then at Common, you have Unfathomable Truths, the five mana devoid draw three make a spawn. And then for Engines, you have Royal Cartographer, which you use extremely well. Essence Reliquary, the three mana artifact that taps to return a permanent to your hand and bespoke battle wagon, the four mana five six vehicle that taps to do a bunch of stuff with energy, um, which is another really good way to use the abundant energy in blue white since it has a spend energy for cards mode. And then so you have like those as card advantage, and then in the best case, you get uncommon removal like Static Prison and Ajani Fells the Godsire. Static Prison is the white enchantment that makes two energy when it enters, and then it's like an Oblivion Ring, and you have to spend an energy every turn or sacrifice it. And Ajani Fells the Godsire is the saga that starts by exiling a creature with mana value or with power three or greater. And then you also have Thrab and Charm. At common, the charm with three modes, one of which is damage equal to twice the number of creatures you control to target creature, witch enchanter, the uncommon, the disenchants on ETV, demon furrier, the four mana sorcery that puts a creature second from the top or on the bottom that costs one less for each card you've drawn, razor grass ambush, the DFC that does three to an attacker or blocker, expel the unworthy, the Kicker, Exile a Creature, Sorcery, Utter Insignificance, the enchantment that you can spend colorless and two to exile the creature and just makes it a 1-1 one with, one, one with no abilities until then, which is a combo with Essence Reliquary that lets you slowly exile all of your opponent's creatures. So you have like a bunch of kind of like late low priority removal there, also Dog Umbra. And then you have like Rose Cot Knight, the five mana th three four vigilance that when it enters looks at the top six cards to put an artifact or enchantment from among them into your hand. That can find a lot of your removal and card draw engines and really like tie everything together um, in a pretty clean way. Essence Reliquary is very good with any saga, which means that it works both with the Johnny Fells the God Sire to give you recurring removal and creature generation. And also Tamiyo meets the story circle to give you a recurring clue generation and shuffling cards into your graveyard. So like the, the deck grinds very well and can establish a very strong late game and like have 
recurring removal, card draw, go through its deck, and then you have like big over-the-top finishers like Decree of Justice, the sorcery that makes angels and cycles to make soldiers, as well as Angel of the Ruins, the 5-6 flyer that exiles two artifacts or enchantments when it enters, and you can play some big Eldrazi. There's also just Volt Surge Angel, the 5-mana 4-4 flyer that makes energy, and then you can spend it to pump your team or give it lifelink and vigilance at the beginning of combat on your turn. So I think that like the cards are very much there for blue-white control. The issue is that it doesn't use the best cards in blue-white very well, which means that you kind of have to commit to it pretty early. And it's weird because there aren't that many, like, super high picks that strongly suggest that you should draft it. Like, the good thing about it is that it uses cards that other people don't want all that much really well, but they still have to, like, be opened and you have to hope no one else just, like, takes them even though they're not great for other people and stuff like that. Overall, I'm a lot more personal. Like, the the control deck, I think, is very fun. Of course, looking at decks that like have trophied that other people played, I th- I would say that they tend to be more mid-range than I would personally prefer. That's basically always the case. People uh, in aggregate just kind of like take the good cards or just take cards to a curve or whatever. Um, whereas I personally really like to draft a very, very focused deck and strategy. But the the mid-range deck makes sense and works. There are cards that kind of bridge the aggressive and controlling plans, like Serum Visionary and Solstice Zealot, that kind of like play well both ways, let you curve out. Solstice Zealot lets you, you know, stop them from blocking or stop them from attacking. Kind of bridges into a late game where you have a couple of bigger cards. You're mostly, you know, curving out, but have some top end. So while I'm generally going to try to focus on being like very, very all in evasive flyers or long game control, there's certainly room for mid range blue white strategy. I'd also like to speak to Metastatic Evangel. That's the 2-mana 3-1 whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control proliferate. It plays very, very well in blue-white because you have both energy and plus 1, plus 1 counters to proliferate. You also can get shield counters from the pack beast, and most importantly, it's really incredible with Emissary of Soulfire because Emissary of Soulfire, the uncommon that gives you exalted counters, lets you spend the abundant energy that you have to put exalted counters on each of your creatures, and then the proliferate adds to all of them. And then you end up just having tons of exalted. Then if you have like a gargoyle, you get to send a giant flying lifelink in. That package plays out extremely well. If you see either, if you end up with either Evangel or Emissary of Soulfire, I recommend prioritizing the other one a lot more highly than you otherwise would, because the the combo is very real. As far as splashing, you basically always want to go as far out of your way as you have to to play Scurry of Gremlins in any blue-white deck. As I talked about, you're very good at making energy and not that great at spending it, and Scurry of Gremlins is a very good way to spend energy also just a really strong card if you're in an aggressive deck obviously it's great and if you're in the control deck it's one of the best things that you can pick up with essence reliquary outside of that the controlling build is a lot more interested in splashing than the aggressive build for all the same reasons that i always talk about that control wants to splash more than aggro most likely you're going to be splashing red or black for cheap removal Since the cheap removal available to green is Horrific Assault, and you're not going to be a very good Horrific Assault deck because, as I mentioned, your creatures generally don't have all that much power. There are plenty of rares that you might want to splash in any color. 
Cards like Nadu and Six come to mind as reasonable green splashes. Anything, like, if, if you are in the, like, Essence Reliquary deck, anything that's good to return and recast would be a reasonable splash. I think that I've been pretty happy with kind of more balanced Jeskai and more balanced Esper. Where, you know, you're not really splashing, but you're using a lot of the same cards that the blue-white control deck is interested in, but just kind of pairing it with, like, m maybe a higher density of red or black removal or red energy cards or black ETB effects or whatever. And, yeah, that's basically what I have to say about this. Main takeaways, a control deck is there if you mean it. Most of the tools for it do not perform well in aggregate or aggressive blue-white decks, so you really want to figure out what your plan is on the earlier side when you're drafting blue-white. All else equal, air toward aggressive flyers. In the aggressive flyer deck, I think in general, removal and top-end is better than aggressive non-evasive creatures. You have trouble getting those through, and I think you should kind of try to stick to, like, a Skies situation. But, you know, obviously stuff like Serum Visionary and Solstice Zealot don't count as, like, non-evasive threats. Those are doing a different thing. Those are, you know... Visionary is a value creature and Zealot's a tapper. What I'm saying is that you're not very excited about cards like Hex Gold Slith and the Bestow Unicorn. And, uh, yeah, that's what I have to say about Blue White. So I'm going to thank the newest patrons and turn it over to chat. So thank you, Gu Jiangxi and Vincent, for the support. I really appreciate it. And the chat, what do you have for me? Every time I start going into blue white, I always end up just guy. What would make you want to stick with Azorius and not splash? Multiple gargoyles, because even just discharge, and I really want to play that. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you have multiple gargoyles, like the usual thing that I say about not splashing in aggro decks, especially when you have a bunch of like two color gold two drops the mana just gets pretty awkward i understand the desire to splash a discharge but i don't really think you need to like yes discharge is better than dog umbra but it's not like so much better that you need it and i think like i would rather have clean mana in my aggressive deck than go out of my way to splash a slightly more efficient removal spell. So, yeah, I, I think that, like, you know, as I said, I think that the control build splashes very well and is pretty interested in discharge, but I think that if you have a bunch of, like, kites and gargoyles, that it's not worth messing up your mana with the, like, colorless, the common, the landscapes, and the, like, off-color lands. What are my feelings on Electrozoa? I think that Electrozoa works pretty well as an aggressive threat, an evasive threat. You have a bunch of energy, you can pay for it. It's certainly not as good as the like premium flyers, but I think that it's like a better filler aggressive creature than like the Unicorn and Hex Gold Slith, as long as your curve wants the three drop. I will say that Hope Ender Aquaddle, the 2 2 flyer with flash that counters unless they pay one, is very good in blue white, and having both that and Electrozo is pretty good. You can pass with three mana up if they give you the opportunity to force spike something successfully. You do that. If they don't, you play the Electrozoa. And then you get to hold up the Hope Ender 
the next turn to see if they run into it so that you can you know maximize your chances of like getting them while still developing your board have i tried playing the land that moves counters with the blue or white sagas do you think it's worth it so i do think that moving a counter off of the white saga in particular is pretty good but I'm worried about a lack of other things that you're happy to do with it in, like, blue-white. If I had, like, multiple sagas and I'm only two-color, I could consider it, especially if I have some other plus-one, plus-one counters. But I don't think I like the idea of a colorless land just to potentially extend, like, a saga once. Um, If I only have one saga, it just seems like it's asking a lot. I think, you know, I'm more interested in that, like, if I'm black-white with the Persist Gargoyle and have the Saga, um, but I think it's, like, pretty low upside there. Essence Reliquary is definitely a better way to use the Sagas. I suppose one thing that often gets asked is how and when to get into blue-white. The answer is... It's not clear to me. I personally have drafted blue-white very rarely, and that also seems true of other people. I think that it would be correct to end up blue-white more often than I do and other people do, but it's difficult to find a way there. Mostly, I don't think that there are single cards that strongly suggest that blue-white exactly is where you should be. I think that I would suggest looking to be blue-white a little bit more than you do, but I don't have a clear prescription about exactly when. Just kind of, like, be aware of what you can do with it and look to see if the cards that let you do that are there. That That's my intent going forward. But there's not a lot that very strongly suggests, hey, do exactly this. And like, Genku, the rare that makes tokens, is really, really good. But even that doesn't super strongly suggest that you want to be exactly blue-white, because it plays so well with landscapes that it's very easy to splash into whatever, because you want landscapes so much with it. So... I suppose that, that's that's what I have to say about getting into blue white. It's tricky, but shouldn't be avoided. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up for this week. And I'll be back next week. We're certainly still on MH3 for a while, despite the fact that Bloomberg spoilers have started. So a few more weeks of MH3, and then we'll be on to that whenever whenever it's time. Bye for now and have a good week everyone. Prepare for light speed.